Okay, this is a lecture for my sixth hour class on the 29th of March. Okay, so the Missouri Compromise was passed. Oh, excuse me, the, uh, well, it was passed too, but the uh, uh, Compromise of 1850, I'm sorry, was passed. And um, uh, it, it literally is going to kick off the race to the territories, and both sides are going to meet out in the territories and leave in places like Kansas. And uh, they're going to start shooting. In fact, uh, the shooting in the Civil War started in the 1850s. Uh, even though we weren't, it wasn't exactly, quote, the Civil War, but it starts uh, out, out in Kansas. Uh, and so uh, the country was uh, dividing rapidly in the 1850s. Uh, people were, both sides were threatening violence against the other. And then this little woman comes along named Harriet Beecher Stowe, and she writes a book. And it, it literally, I, I mean, the best way I can describe it is that it, it, it throws gasoline on the flame of this slavery thing. Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly. Um, Mrs. Stowe was a devoutly religious woman. In fact, she was the daughter of the most famous preacher in America at the time, a man named Lyman Beecher, and she was married to the second most famous preacher uh, in America, a man named Calvin Stowe. These guys were the Rick Warrens and the Billy Grahams. Uh, if you think of any famous preachers today, I mean, if they go somewhere and they can fill a massive stadium like Billy Graham used to do. I don't think anybody would be there right now. You don't think there are any? Uh, fill a massive stadium like Billy Graham anymore? Not right now. Well, who are the famous like, preachers? There's a uh, Dennis Murray. Dennis Murray? Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know who that is, but I'll take the word for it. Uh, these guys, Calvin Stowe and Lyman Beecher, were the most famous preachers in America. Uh, and, uh, you know, she was a New Englander. She came right out of the heart of abolitionist country, and she was an abolitionist, and she was a radical abolitionist, an abolitionist that said slavery is evil, it's wrong, and we ought to abolish it because of that. And by the time she wrote this book, she had, her, her husband had taken a church in Cincinnati, Ohio, if you know where Cincinnati is in southern Ohio, it's right on the banks of the Ohio River. Cincinnati was one of the main stations, as they called it, on the Underground Railroad, hundreds of slaves maybe even thousands of slaves heading north to Canada came through Cincinnati. And by the way, the Stowe's, uh, no doubt about it, they, their house was used as one of the stations on the Underground Railroad. And so she had personally seen slaves and taught the slaves who were on the run, and she had heard the horrible, horrible experiences uh, of slavery uh, right there in her own living room, if she will. And when the Compromise of 1850 was passed, um, the North, of course, the, the, the most damning thing about the Compromise of 1850 to the abolitionists and to the North in general was the Fugitive Slave Law. And Harriet Beecher Stowe had a reputation as a writer. I mean, she, she never had written a book, but she could, and I don't know if she ever wrote any other books after Uncle Tom's Cabin, but she was known for her ability to write. And her sister, when the Fugitive Slave Law becomes law, her sister told her, that this is a great crime. And she said, you must write something uh, to alarm the nation concerning the evils of slavery. And so she began to write. And by the way, she was a mother. I think she had three small children. She was running a household. She was cooking. She was sewing. She was doing all that stuff while her husband uh, ran his church. But she uh, found time. I can, all, all, often, I can almost just imagine seeing her sitting in her kitchen, uh, you know, with a baby in her lap and her pen and uh, writing away on the kitchen table. I'm sure it was pretty close to that. Uh, and she started writing the books and chapters, okay? And uh, she took it to a newspaper editor, and the newspaper editor started putting the chapters up in the window of his newspaper. And people, you know, somebody passed by. And the next thing you know, he had a mob out there, and they were all trying to crawl over and read that, and everybody was just waiting for the next chapter. So it's going to actually be published uh, into uh, in chapters. Uh, but here's the storyline. Uh, there was a man, named, the story opens in the state of Kentucky, which, by the way, was right across the Ohio River from Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio. And by the way, the Stoves actually had friends who lived in Kentucky. They were plantation owners. They owned slaves. And the only time in her life that she had ever really seen slaves, I'm not talking about runaways, but slaves at work in the field, is that they occasionally went over to their friend's house 
and she actually saw a plantation with slaves on it working. So the story opens in Kentucky. There's a kindly southern gentleman named Tom Shelby, and he, uh, he owns the plantation. He owns several slaves. And of course, his most trusted slave is an elderly slave that had been with him for many, many years. And this is Uncle Tom, okay? But uh, as happened to slave owners often in the South, uh, you know, they had a bad cotton prices dropped, or they had brought in a bad crop, or a storm destroyed their crop. In other words, he lost money. And when a lot of these slave owners lost money to keep the plantation afloat, they had to sell their slaves. And so Tom Shelby, this slave owner, almost brokenhearted, goes to Tom, this faithful slave of all these years, and he tells him, I'm going to have to sell some of the slaves, and Tom, you're one of them. And Tom is married, his wife is there, you know, she's getting uh, up in years, and Tom is. And, uh, of course, uh, Tom simply said, well, you know, if that's what has to happen, that's what has to happen. Uh, Tom, Tom's a devoutly Christian man, you know, I'm sure he believes in you know what the Bible says, all things work for, for the good. Uh, but Tom Shelby told Uncle Tom this. He said, as soon as we recover economically, I'm going to keep in touch with where you are. And as soon as, as uh, we uh, recover here economically, I'm going to come and I'm going to purchase you uh, back. At the same time, he was going to sell a young girl named Eliza who had two small babies. And Eliza, while they're getting ready to sell these slaves, Eliza comes to Tom. Eliza comes to Tom and says, I'm not going to be sold in slavery. By the way, they're being sold south, and that was never good. Louisiana, Mississippi is being sold south. Um, she said, I'm not going to do it, and she said, I'm not going to subject my children to that. She said, I'm going to run away. And she said to Tom, come go with me. And Tom said, no, I'm old. I'm too old to run away. And he said, besides, I promised the master uh, that, you know, I would stand good for his debts. He's going to sell me, but he's going to come by his back. And he sort of wishes her good luck. And Eliza takes off, and for about a chapter there, you get a picture of uh, the slave catchers after her. At one point, I think she's going across the Ohio River with a baby in each arm. Jumping. It's kind of melodramatic, but jumping from ice flow to ice flow, and she finally gets across, and she makes it to Canada. But you, you get to see what the fugitive, you know, she addresses, I guess you could say, the fugitive slave law in that. Meanwhile, Tom uh, is sold. Uh, he is loaded on a steamboat. And he's heading down the river to be sold at another slave auction and uh, down south, heading for New Orleans, in fact. And he meets this little girl, and this must be, uh, I've heard her described as the uh, most angelic child in all of American literature. It's a little girl named Little Eva St. Clair. And Little Eva's father is a wealthy, wealthy man in the south, and he owned, he's a wealthy slave owner. And they're there, and he's a widower. His wife has passed away. And they're there enjoying this ride down the Ohio River and the Mississippi River. Of course, those steamboats were powered by wood. And so occasionally they would have to pull in and take on water that would be, you know, they'd light a fire and it would boil and it would, you know, create the steam that made the boat move. Anyway, uh, uh, they had to pull in occasionally and load on more wood and water. And they'd done that, and little Eva. And she and Tom become very, very close. You know, Tom sings for her. And, teaches her to play games, and she sings for Tom. And, oh, you know, it's just kind of an uncle-niece uh, uh, relationship. They grow very close. But they're all three standing on the side of the boat, watching it when it's loaded up with wood and water, and it's about to take off again. And Mr. St. Clair is there, and Little Eva's there, and Tom is there, and the boat sort of lurched, and Little Eva fell over into the water. And, of course, her father was just paralyzed. He couldn't believe it. He sees his daughter drowning. But of course, who dives in and saves Little Eva? Uncle Tom. And at that point, uh, Mr. St. Clair buys Tom on the spot. He said, I'm going to take you, and I'm going to take you down to my townhouse in New Orleans, and you're going to essentially live a good life. And yes, that's exactly what happens. He goes, and uh, he, uh, uh, Tom is there in the house. And Tom is an older slave, and he doesn't have to do a lot of hard work. And there are a whole list of characters. There's a Black woman, I think she's the cook, and she has a daughter named Topsy. And Topsy and little Eva are playmates, and Tom, you know, is there with them. And, and oh, they're just, you know, it's just the most, it's just the scene of heaven on earth. And then comes da, 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 the most dramatic, one of the most dramatic scenes of the book. Little Eva gets sick, and she's dying. 
And it's the longest death scene in American literature. If you read the book, it just goes on and on and on. But literally, the roof ceiling will open up and angels will come carry her off to heaven. It's almost like that. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's almost like that. And of course, Mr. St. Clair is just grief stricken. I mean, he just cannot believe that his whole life was his little daughter. And uh, so after the funeral, uh, he's not a drinking man. He doesn't drink, but after the funeral, he decides to go to a saloon and have a drink. And uh, he's there drowning his sorrows and two ruffians in this bar get into a fight. And uh, Mr. St. Clair, who is the mob, uh, the, as I used to say, the morals of decorum, he's good in every way, he's decent, honorable. And he says, uh, he steps over to separate the two brawling men. And, uh, you know, he says, now, now, you know, let's not fight. And one of them says, oh, yeah, let's fight. And takes a knife out and stabs Mr. St. Clair in the heart and kills him. So now Mr. St. Clair is gone. His sister lived at his townhouse with him. And he had willed everything to his sister. And his sister, by the way, happened to be, they happened to be from the north, actually. And uh, his sister says, I don't want to live in this uh, godforsaken uh, human city of New Orleans anymore. I'm going to sell everything. I'm going to sell everything I've got. I'm going to sell the house. I'm going to sell it all and all the slaves that she does. And she sells uh, Tom and the slaves to one of the most, this is the arch villain of uh, American literature, a man named Simon Legree. Okay. If somebody calls you a Simon Legree, that means you're evil, you're cruel. And uh, Simon Legree uh, has a plantation way out in the Red River country of Louisiana, way out of the swamps, out in the middle of nowhere. It's the lap of age, it's run down, it's collapsing, and all that and Simon Legree lives in there by himself, and all he does is he gets drunk and he beats his slaves. All he, he doesn't care about, either. his clothes are ragged, you know, everything's run down, the place looks like an abandoned shack. He doesn't care about that, he's just there to make money, and he'll do anything. Uh, with these slaves to make money. So he whips them and he beats them. And he whips Tom and he'll whip Tom out of the fields. You know, Tom now has to go out in the fields and work and he'll whip Tom because Tom isn't picking cotton or, or doing whatever task he assigned him quickly enough. And Tom just keeps praying and singing hymns. Okay. And finally, finally, two female slaves come to Tom and they say, We're going to escape. They're young women. They said, We cannot take this anymore. And Tom, Come go with us. And once again, Tom says, no, I can't. He said, my master, Tom Shelby, promised that he's coming to get me. And I can't leave this place, plus I'm too old. And so the two girls run away and they escape. And again, you get a picture there. And this is a good picture of the Underground Railroad and how it worked. And the slave catchers chase them all the way to Canada. But they make it too. But the next morning when Simon Legree is lining the slaves up to take them out to the fields to work. He noticed that two are missing, and he starts uh, cursing and screaming, and he's half drunk, and he's filthy, and he stinks. Uh, and by the way, he is a northerner, too. You know, he's not a southerner. The villains, it's interesting in this book, the villains in this book are all northerners. The good Christian upright people are southerners. You know, and That's the way she intended to write the book. She said when she wrote this book, I don't want it to, to or her thought was, I don't want it to be a book that just condemns the South. I want it, I guess as one of our news stations would say today, I want it to be fair and balanced, okay? So the, so the bad guys are really the Northerners. Anyway, uh, he comes up to Tom and he's got a whip and he says, where are those girls? And Tom said, didn't say, I don't know, because he would have been lying. And he would have said, he said, I, I, I can't tell you. And he said, oh, yeah, you're going to tell me. And he calls him, you black beast. And Tom says, no, I can't tell you. And uh, he says, you will tell me. He said, I own you bought. I think this is a direct quote from the story. I've got the book at home on it. Uh, years. Anyway, uh, I, I own you body and soul, you black beast. And Tom at that point says, well, you may own my body, but you don't own my soul. And he goes in a little dissertation about Christianity and his soul and how when he dies, he's going to heaven and so on and so forth. And that probably was not a good time to do that. But uh, Simon Legree starts beating him. And he literally, he drags him in a barn and starts beating him with the butt of the whip and uh, just beats him to a pulp this old man. And Simon Legree, half drunk, is leaning on the barn door with his whips, the bloody whip in his hand, and Tom is gasping out his last 
and who arrives but a young man. It's not Tom Shelby, it's Tom Shelby Jr. Tom Shelby was dead. Uh, and this young man walks up to Tom, or he walks up to Simon Marie and says, you know, I'm looking for a slave named Tom. I want to buy him from you. And Marie just rather cold-heartedly says, uh, take him for free. He said, I don't charge for the dead ones. And uh, Tom Shelby Jr. kneels down. And of course, when Tom Shelby Jr. was a little boy, Tom had bounced him on his knee. And it's a moving death scene. And Tom dies, and then Tom Shelby gets <laughs> Simon Legree a real thrashing. And he goes back to Kentucky, sells all of his slaves, and they all become abolitionists. So there's a quick review of 400 and some odd pages of Uncle Tom's cap. That's, that's the story. Let me tell you, uh, the success of this book was phenomenal. Uh, when she wrote the book, somebody asked her, do you hope to make any money off this? She said, I hope to make enough to buy a dress. Well, uh, it sold. Uh, and by the way, she sold the copyright to the book for just $300. And as it turns out, Uncle Tom's Cabin was the Harry Potter twi slash Twilight of the 19th century. Uh, the impact on Uncle Tom was probably greater than those two books. Do you read those books? Have you read those books? Okay, well, it's probably greater than those two books for this reason. Uh, there was no, and there was no television. Um, there was no television, uh, no radio, no movies. So people actually sat down and read books. That's what they did for entertainment. Uh, Mrs. Stowe became J.K. Rowling or the Stephanie Myers of the day. The book sold 10,000 copies on the first day of publication and sold 300,000 copies in the first year. It was eventually published in 22 languages and sold around the world. And how much did Mrs. Stowe make off of all of this? So we have $300. 300 bucks, okay, 300 bucks. From the South came these venomous, hateful letters. Uh, copies of Uncle Tom were seized and burned. The mobs broke into post offices and rifled through the mail that was waiting to be sorted in case they found one of these books they would burn it. When boats, steamboats, pulled into port and stagecoaches came south, they examined the luggage, and any time they found one of these uh, books, they burned it. And, of course, all sorts of threatening letters came to Mrs. Stowe. One letter came to Mrs. Stowe. Uh, the man uh, had included in the letter, he had cut off the ear of one of his slaves, and in that letter, he um, uh, put the bloody ear of the slave. And, of course, Mrs. Stowe was absolutely baffled by this. In her view, she said, she said, I, I didn't mean this as an attack on the South. She felt like she had been fair. Like I say, both the slave owners, Tom Shelby and August Augustine St. Clair, were Christian gentlemen who treated their slaves very kindly. And the villain of the story was Simon Legree. He was from Vermont. He was a transplanted Vermonter, a northerner who had come south. But still, this book, what it did is that it exposed the evils of slavery at their worst. It's full of slave auctions and slave dogs and whippings and beatings and families being separated. And to Southerners, they said, this is a vicious attack upon the South and our way of life. And of course, this also introduced, today, you know, if something happen, happens in Massachusetts, we will know about it in an instant. But it's actually, it was actually possible to be living in the North in the 18th and know very little, if anything at all, about slavery. But this book introduced the North for the first time, many Northerners, to the horrors of slavery. Uh, and uh, it further, it further divided the nation and I gave you the quote yesterday. Where was she from again? She? Yeah. She was from Connecticut. How did she know so much about slavery? How did she? Well, she, she, moved, well, first of all, she was a fairly educated woman. And, you know, they read and they read papers and that sort of thing. Uh, and kept up with the national debate going on in Congress. But they moved down to Ohio. And Ohio, you know, Cincinnati, right? Cincinnati was, you know, the Ohio River divided free America from slave America. And, and of course, you know, her kitchen was uh, one of the uh, stations on the Underground Railroad. They fed and clothed and helped the wounded slaves that were trying to escape. And she heard it firsthand. You know, in history, they call that empirical evidence. It's not what somebody told you or what you read, what somebody wrote in a book. It's something you actually experienced. It's something you actually saw with your own eyes. And she did. And she did. Okay. What well, was, huh? What was, like, the punishment if you got caught? Like, 
would hiding a slave or something. Well, you know, I mean, when you got back to your plantation, you might have been whipped. Although whipping, uh, whippings were were. You know, I don't want to read too much into this, but whippings were often rare because of, this is a horrible. But those slaves were valuable property. And again, like I said to you, if somebody has a whip, I go back to John McCain, who ran for president against Barack Obama in 2008. When he waved to an audience, he had to wave like this because the North Vietnamese, and when he was in prison, and whipped him with bamboo. Somebody that knows what they're doing can permanently disabled you. Well, what happens if a slave is permanently disabled? He's sitting on the plantation or she's sitting on the plantation. They can't do any work or they can't do much work and you've got to feed and clothe them, you know, every day. It's just, you know, so, 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 you know, and I don't want to, you know, there were plenty of weapons. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Slaves sometimes were, I, I've read of an instance where a slave was hanged. He was brought back by the slave catchers and they assembled all the slaves and they said, this guy ran away and I don't know, we caught him in Pennsylvania. And this is what happens to slaves that run away. And they hanged him right there in front of the other slaves. But I still think that was kind of rare. There would be some kind of punishment. They might make you wear a muzzle. They might make you work all day uh, in the field with a muzzle on. You couldn't eat for a week, maybe. You couldn't drink water, uh, so there were there were punishments uh, that they could uh, that they could and, and did use. Well, so by 1854, let's go to 1854 very quickly. By 1854, the country was so divided over the issue of slavery in the territories that we couldn't even discuss building a railroad to connect the country. You know about this, the Transcontinental Railroad. But we couldn't even do that. We couldn't even talk about that without it degenerating into a shouting match between the North and the South. We couldn't even talk about building a railroad to, to link this country from east to west without uh, Southerners getting up and screaming about secession and Northerners getting up saying, if you try and secede, we will uh, force you back in the Union. You know, ever since the United States had won the Mexican session in 1848, people had been calling for the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. You know, the great fear was, especially after, at first there wasn't that great of a fear, but when the California Gold Rush takes place and 300,000 people go out to California, the great fear was is that 300,000 people out there would simply secede, break that part of the nation away, and start their own, their own country. And so by 1854, most people, there was a point of agreement between the North and the South, and that was that the West had to be connected to the rest of the country. But the big question was, the big question was, where was the railroad going to begin that would connect, look, would connect the West to the East? And Northerners had their plan, and Southerners had theirs. Northerners said, get this down, the railroad should leave from Chicago. And the man pushing that in 1854 was named Stephen A. Douglas. We'll talk more about him later, but write him down. He's sort of a, well, he's, he, he and Lincoln, they're both from Illinois and they're both lawyers. Stephen Douglas, who was called, he was a senator. Senator Stephen Douglas, he was called the Little Giant, okay? And he was from Illinois. And he wants that railroad rail to Illinois. Southerners, on the other hand, wanted it to start, get this down, in New Orleans. And Southerners thought they had the best argument. Southerners said, look, if it takes that northern route, what will it encounter out here? Mountains. The mountain of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, you can take a straight shot across the flatlands of Texas and the desert. You can take a straight shot across the flatlands of the desert, and it'll be much easier and much quicker the bill. But both sides do this. Get this down. Whichever side got this railroad, you know, railroads moved to America. Whichever side got this railroad would grow in population. That meant more representatives in the House of Representatives. That meant more senators. It would grow in population and it would grow in wealth. And both, both sides want this railroad. Excuse me just a second. Hello?
How are you? Anyway, both sides wanted that railroad. Now the South, though, said, we want this flat country. Maybe this will help him, too. He can get another job besides bothering people. Anyway, the South said it's flat country, but look at this right here. The Northerner said, you can't build that from New Orleans because the proposed route from New Orleans to California runs right through here, and this today is southern Arizona. You see that river? That's the Gila River right there. And that piece of territory right there was not owned by the United States. In other words, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that gave this to the United States didn't, didn't include that strip of territory right there. And when Northerners brought that up during, during the debate of where the railroad would begin, Southerners said, well, that's no big problem. In fact, get this down. They, they, the ambassador to Mexico, our, our ambassador, think about how fortunate the South is here. The U.S. ambassador to Mexico was a man named James Gadsden. Okay, he was a Southerner, he was a slave owner. So James Gadsden, and guess what he had made his fortune in? Railroads. He was a railroad man. And so they said, if the only thing holding this uh, southern route up is that little piece of territory right there, uh, we'll just buy it. Uh, and James Gadsden was authorized. He entered into negotiations. And uh, to make a long story short, for $10 million. You understand, that's almost what we paid for all of Louisiana in 1803, 47 years before this, or 40. Anyway, 40 some odd years, nearly 50 years before this. And the United States bought that strip of territory and it became known as, got this now, the Gadsden Purchase. Gadsden, and it's the first, uh, the Gadsden Purchase. Uh, and by the way, when the Gadsden Purchase was, was bought, purchased, uh, it finally completed the continental United States. That was the completion of what is today the continental United States, okay? So Southerners said, we're ready to go. We want to build this through, the, through the, the, the Southern route. Plus, get this down, I got this down. <clears throat> Southerners said, not only, you know, the, the, the North is just a bad route. Not only do you uh, uh, have the mountains here, but that will have to pass through. Let's see if I've got a better map. Well, there's the gas and purchase. That shows you it a little better. Okay, 10 million bucks. There's Douglas. You know. uh, that was a very small amount of land, $10 million. Well, it's, it, I'm telling you, depending on who's telling the story, we bought all of Louisiana for 12 or $15 million. So it's almost what we paid for that, even though it's almost 50 years later. Anyway, they said, that's, like, that's what I want to show you. They said, if you build that, you're going to have to bring that railroad through Nebraska Territory. And get this down. And Southerners said, Nebraska Territory is an unorganized territory. In other words, it's not ready yet. There's nobody out there. There's nothing out there but the gophers and the jackrabbits. There aren't enough people out there to make a state. <clears throat> There's no law and order. It's this wild, wide open territory. <clears throat> it's an unorganized territory. You don't want to build a, a, a railroad through that. <coughs> it's an untamed wilderness. Well, enter into the picture the man who wants to be president that I mentioned just a moment ago. There he is, Stephen, Stephen Arnold Douglas. He was five foot two, I think. He and uh, Harry Beecher Stowe could have been good dancing partners. Stephen Arnold Douglas, he was called the little giant and his all-consuming goal was to be president of the United States. And he believed if he could get that railroad from the north, because the north is where the population is, he believed if he could get that railroad from the north, from, for the north in 1854, that northerners would elect him president in 1856. He was a great rough and tumbler debater. He was an alcoholic. He drank whiskey by the gallon. And I mean, he drank right on the floor of the Senate when he made speeches. And he was profane. He would walk in tear his tie off, sling his coat over the chair, and then tear open the front of his shirt and stand there, this little stub of a guy out there, and he would make all of these speeches on the floor, and he was loud, and he was profane, and every other word, I'm not trying to be crude here, but was GD, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and by the way, when he got up to speak, 
you know, if you were in the Senate and they said, uh, the chair, uh, you know, uh, I, the, the, the president of the Senate said, I recognize the senator from Illinois, Senator Douglas. The ushers immediately went up and they cleared all the women out of the balcony. In other words, they said, you, you don't want, you don't want to hear this. Um, and he said this, he said to the Southerners, he said, and, and then he wants that railroad for Chicago. That's his ticket to the White House, he believes. And he said to them, it's your only opposition to a northern route for this railroad is the fact that it goes through unorganized territory. Then we'll organize the territories. We'll start getting, and by that he means we'll start getting those states ready to come into states. And so he, to do that, get this down, he offered one of the most fateful pieces of legislation ever to go before the Congress. And by the way, I've read historians who said, had, had this not been passed, even as late as 1854, there was a way out for the North and South to avoid a civil war. The law that uh, Stephen Douglas always associated with it, the, the law that he proposed, and it will pass. And, and I mean, it's just the force of personality. He's going to run it through the Congress of the United States. It's called the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. And here's what it did. Number one, it divided Kansas. Let's see if I've got a picture. Uh, it divided Kansas and Nebraska into two separate territories. No longer was this big mass of land out there on the northern neck of the Louisiana Purchase, just Nebraska. Now it's Kansas and Nebraska. Number two, okay, so that's the first thing. But then what the big question is, okay, Senator, you've divided it into Kansas and Nebraska. Now what is the question? How do you get people to go out there? Nope. What, what's the big question now? What's the question? Oh, are they going to be slave states? Are those going to be slave? Who gets those states? And Douglas said, aha. You know, here's my answer. Got this down. He said, we're going to let the people in each state vote. What's that called? Public sovereignty. Yeah. Who's the guy that came up with that? From Michigan? Uh, Webster. No, no. Webster was from Massachusetts. Yeah. I've forgotten that. I can't remember. That's an honest question. Who was that? Anyway. Webster didn't come up with it. Excuse me. Webster didn't come up with it, but Douglas didn't come up with it. Well, I don't have time to worry about it. You have been with it. Anyway, I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, Douglas took that over, and popular sovereignty, the other guy you never hear of him. Uh, but Douglas took that over, and popular sovereignty became his baby. But now there's a problem. You tell me. So now Kansas gets to vote on slavery, Nebraska gets to vote on slavery, but what's the problem with that? It's a very compromise. Huh? A little 36, 30. Both of those states or territories were above the 36, 30 line. Both of them were above the 36, 30 line. So how did Douglas say? They said, you can't do that. You can't. Those states can never be slave according to to the law. And how did Douglas handle that? What did he say? Unconstitutional. Huh? No. no. Hey, my, well, what did he do? Well, Missouri is a slave state. Huh? It's yeah, a well, Missouri. that's one argument. Missouri is a slave state. What did he do? What's the third point of the, of the Kansas Nebraska Act? Do away with the Missouri Compromise. Okay, get that done. Do away with the 36 30 model. And Douglas believed this was a perfect plan. He said, number one, it'll get the government out of the argument over slavery in the territory and let the people decide. And he said, what could be more democratic than that? Douglas is the power to the people guy. He also believed that both sides would eventually be happy with this because look at this, Missouri, that you pointed out just a moment ago, Missouri was a slave state. And there's little Iowa. It was a free state. And Douglas said, when those are open for settlement, the Iowans will go to Nebraska, and when it comes to time to vote on whether or not Nebraska is going to be a slave state or a free state, how will they vote? Free. free state. So the North gets two senators. And these Missourians, these Southern slave owner Missourians, will come into, into Kansas, and when it comes time to vote as to whether or not Kansas 
Just a second. Becomes a slave state or a free state. How will they vote? Slave state. The South will get two senators. The North will get two senators. We'll preserve the sexual balance. I'll be happy. The railroad will be happy. The North will be happy. The South will be happy. And I will be the president of the United States. Perfect plan. And it passes. He rams it through. And then it blew up in his face. He never became the president of the United States. And this plan never worked. And the reason was what you all point out. Very good. That both Kansas and Nebraska were above the old 3639. And slavery had been forbidden there. But listen, I get this down. Don't miss the point. But to advance, listen, he thinks the North will elect him. But what's he just done in the Kansas-Nebraska Act? He's opened up territories that could never have been slave to the possibility of becoming slave. And the North never forgives him. The North never forgives Stephen Douglas. That's in 1856. And four years later, when he thinks I ought to be president, they're going to elect someone from Illinois, but it's not going to be Stephen Douglas. Who is it going to be? Abraham Lincoln. That's exactly right. And what's Abraham Lincoln running on? There will be no slavery in the territories if you elect we Republicans. And it all blows up in his face. And uh, Douglas, I feel for him in some ways, he's sort of a sad character, but he, he's dying after 18, you know, he, you know, when they swore Lincoln in, Stephen Douglas, who was Lincoln's political opponent, this is the way we used to do politics, and then we'll talk about the election of 1860, and I guarantee you it's, it's a horrible commitment. But Stephen Douglas held the open Bible that Abraham Lincoln took the oath of office on. And then Douglas goes south, where he was hated. He goes into, well, not, he goes south, and um, he spends, he's dying. Uh, you know, should have gone home and laid to bed and died peacefully. Uh, he, he goes south on a train tour, fighting against secession, telling Southerners, don't secede. Whatever our differences are, we must save this union. So he has an heroic end. I admire Douglas uh, for that. Somebody write this down. So, uh, so well. Anyway, I'll I'll say more about I'll say more about the Kansas and Brass now. We'll put it up there. So he didn't get rid of that 30, 30 line. And if he just got them to be free states, he probably would have became president. Might have. Might have. It's interesting, the North will vote against him and the South will vote for him. I can't believe I don't remember who Joe Carver was talking to. Like right there, it's just not. Well, I can't remember it either enough. That guy, was it? 